Hi there, my name is Nicholas Bamton. I'm a futurist. I help my clients look out 5, 10, 20 plus years into the future. Myself and my think tank come together to help our clients create bolder visions of their futures. They can strengthen strategic planning and anticipate risks. And that really creates an urgency around what we can create in the future for everyone in humanity. And I started this journey very young at the age of eight. My father gave me this book, the Osborne Book of the Future. And when I went to university, I did artificial intelligence. I graduated. I worked in large data systems most of my adult life in the last 10 years. I focused on futures and broadened my perspectives into sociological, societal, and technological challenges ahead of us. And to do that, I work with my clients and I encourage them to broaden their mindsets and to, to really push against the poverty of imagination by wondering uh, what if the world was going to be different instead of looking at today what is what is happening and what we need to be concerned about that what if pushes us into a future where we can be creative and start to wonder how the world can be now we're very excited to be here doing this presentation and later on I'm going to be joined by Melissa Esegbegi who's going to be talking a little bit about algorithmic allyship and active allyship as well. So that's really exciting. Firstly, we'd like to do a Toronto land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land we are broadcasting from is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. In addition, we want to have a statement of allyship. We stand as allies with those that have been and continue to be excluded and discriminated against, including, but not limited to, those people that are considered too old for work, seen as not able, those that are neurologically divergent, without access to services needed to effectively operate in a technologically colonized world, and the LGBTQ2S plus BIPOC and marginalized communities around the world. So this keynote is called Facing Our Futures, and we have to do that with bravery and understanding that we play an active role in shaping the futures for everyone. And working in the insurance industry, it's, it's about protecting people, it's about being accountable, and it's about listening, learning, and working together. But I like to start off by talking a little bit about where we came from, the industrial revolutions. So 200 plus years ago, uh, we had a world that was defined by innovation across three different parts of society. We had communications, we had energy and transportation. Now we find ourselves in a world in the fourth industrial revolution where everything is connected and internetized. Communications run faster than ever. Renewable energy is the hot topic and the essential path forward for us to get off of fossil fuels. And transportation is becoming electrified and automated. And this provides some positives for humanity and some challenges as well. And this presentation, I go into the signals of change, the things that we see around us globally and also locally that shape how our industries work. And this also applies to the insurance industry. And to have that broad perspective of humanity and progress is going to be really important going ahead. And futurists like us in the think tank start to really work with clients to broaden those perspectives. So I hope that you enjoy what we present to you in this keynote. Okay, the first thing we're going to look at are global shifts. As we start talking about global shifts, we have to talk about the pandemic. It's affected our lives. It's affected how we can be together. It's affected the industries that we rely on, everything from travel to retail to uh, factory work to blue collar and white collar occupations as well. Uh, it's shaken us up and it's shaken us literally and psychologically as well. But we're starting to see more shifts coming from this point forward, and it's exciting times. The first thing that I think is incredibly exciting is, is the growth of sub-Saharan Africa. The median age of, of people in Africa is 18 years old. There's going to be a huge amount of hope, and the growth is going to be spectacular. 
And what's going to happen is there's going to be a huge shift to urban centers. In fact, by 2050, 2.5 billion people are going to live in urban centers. And 90% of that will happen in Africa and Asia. Uh, we're already starting to see that today, but the growth is going to be incredible in those places. And we're also going to see in 2030 a changing of the guard in terms of economic powers. China and India are going to take number one and number two positions with the US in a third position in terms of GDP growth. And that's going to really start to change the dynamics of our world. In fact, 35% of global GDP will be from Asian countries by 2030. And six of the world's 10 largest economies could be in Asia in the next decade. And the cities are growing Whilst we've seen cities in the West dominate places like Los Angeles, New York City, down in Mexico as well, and we've also seen growth in the East, we're going to see this continue over the years. By 2050, we start to see huge growth in places like Africa and India. And by 2100, the, the largest cities in the world are going to be on the African and, and Asian continents. In fact, Lagos, Nigeria is going to be nearly 88 million people by the year 2100, based on uh, some predictions and uh, data work done by the United Nations and the University of Toronto. And what's interesting is that there's going to be shifts and people are going to move around the world, uh, which is a great thing for economies and a, a global, broader perspective in the world. So people are going to move everywhere to North America and Europe and Australasia and, and beyond. And that is going to be a great mind share. Lots of innovation is going to come out of Africa and Asia. And people are going to be taking those ideas from the countries that they're not from back to the countries where they came from. So places like Africa and India are going to really benefit from that shared knowledge coming home as well. But we have to really also bear in mind the shift in terms of the climate. Climate change is real and no one can deny that. This year we've seen everything from floods to, to lakes drying up to water shortages to, to forest fires and it's been incredibly tough from one side of the planet to the next we're heading to the warmest period that we've ever seen and it is caused by the fossil fuels that we've burnt and thrown that toxic uh, waste and output into the atmosphere and we're getting global water stress and all of these things are going to be really important considerations when we're thinking about insurance and policy making going forward but one of the ways we can start to plan is to start thinking about the landscape of the fuels that we burn. And uh, in the future, we're not going to burn fuel. So fossil fuels are going to die off. Uh, there's going to be onshore and offshore wind, utility scale solar, decentralized solar as well on a per property basis. That's rooftop photovoltaics, hydro, geothermal, and all of these are going to come together. And this is this comes from Carl Burkhart, and this is a, a, an idea of about 140 different countries getting together. And if they align their goals, we could start to get out of the predicament that we're in from the year 2030 and beyond. But I like to talk about four different states of, of the future. We either continue, we either have limits and discipline, we potentially decline and collapse. And some may say that we've seen a lot of, of that happening in the past year. But I think that we can come together, come up with solutions and start to think about our way out of this predicament that we're in and start to think about transformation out of the jaws of collapse. And I think that it's really interesting to think about that as our future, a transforming and generative and collaborative future with insurance as its backbone. So part of the transformation is about evolving our workplace. And let's look at some thinking behind that. When we talk about evolving workplaces, we have to really challenge some false narratives. One, one of such being that we're, we can be more productive if we're at home, uh, whereas in fact, uh, it's sort of a false sense of productivity of awareness and the ability to get more work done and uh, people have seen a blurred boundary of of where we work and where we live in fact we've seen over 40 billion more emails in the past year than we saw previously so people are even more involved with work than ever before they're trying to overthink and they're trying to really challenge you know the situation around them and also we've seen a huge increase in weekly meeting time since February 2020. 
And if we look at this, this is a study that Microsoft undertook when they're actually seeing gaps between online meetings. And if we just keep kept careering through eight hours a day, Zoom calls, Microsoft team meetings and the such like, then we see a, a real neurological challenge and burnout and stress. Uh, but if we actually take breaks, things are a lot better. But we haven't really been good at managing those boundaries personally and also from a managerial perspective. That's because we, we live at work and we work from home and we can't see the difference anymore. I felt that and I'd been working from my home studio for the past 18 months and uh, it's always been tough and it continues to be difficult, although very convenient. But now we're heading into a world of hybrid work. Three days in the office, two days at home. It's actually not a bad balance. You can actually be collaborative in the office. Or you can be productive at home. You can set those boundaries. And that new ma mantra will enable us to be more productive and sort of counteract those false narratives. And in fact, we're now at a very challenging time as well. In all of our businesses, we're going to be seeing people really question what they're doing working at these companies. 46% of workforce are planning to move because they can now work remotely. The world is literally their virtual oyster. Before we go further talking about workplace evolution, we think about technology, let's come back to humanity. Let's talk about inclusion and diversity very quickly. Privilege is the ability to be able to look away and to not act when you're confronted with your bias and complicity, says Daisy Orga Dominguez. And these are incredibly important words. We can fundamentally see our positions in the workplace as being sacred and protected, but many people do not feel like that. They don't feel that they're recognized, they're seen, they're given the opportunities that many of us have got. Diversity ultimately enhances creativity, innovation, and it leads to better decision making and problem solving in the workplace. I mean, we can just look at some of the statistics and there are many out there, but one I like to draw on is something we can connect with. $42 million in firm value is generated by having female representation in top management. And that's a study that's been done by Dezo and Ross. And it's interesting when we just see that one dimension of diversity and inclusion having an incredible effect. So consider when we have older and younger people involved everywhere from the uh, operations within the organization and service all the way up to the board, when we start to consider people that don't necessarily have degrees and we bring in different education levels and that diversity adds some spice to the organization, a huge amount of creativity. And we start to think about uh, gender fluidity and, and different uh, recognitions of of what gender you recognize yourself as and we see our colleagues as equals across the organization and then obviously we have to recognize the power of the LGBTQ2S plus community in the scheme of things as well and obviously we can consider race and so much more it's about balance and equity it's about inclusion it's about empowerment and we cannot leave anyone behind but this needs to be within the hearts and minds of every single person in the organization, whether they work in service or management or strategy or technology and other parts of the business. And to really double down and start thinking about making inclusion and diversity work, McKinsey's come up with a number of principles. We have to ensure the representation of diverse talent. We have to strengthen leadership accountability and capabilities to support inclusion and diversity up and down the organization. We have to enable equality of opportunity through fairness and transparency. We have to promote openness and tackle microaggressions, these small moments across the organization that makes the life tough for so many people that need to be supported. And we need to foster belonging through unequivocal support for, for multivariate diversity. So now let's get back and start thinking about workplace evolution and uh, obviously inclusion diversity is a bedrock of that but let's start thinking about technology and service evolution as well where we can all have a part to play in the evolution of our world and I like to really ground us in thinking of adding the extra dimension of biology into something I'm calling infinite humanity. 
So we've still got that communications, energy and transportation running faster than ever before. Everything is internetized and connected. And now biology has joined that as well. And we've seen that addition of biological data coming into the insurance industry as an important reference point. But it's also something we need to be very careful about as well. And I like to think about software over the past 25 years. In fact, a few years ago, Mark Andreessen, very famous Silicon Valley entrepreneur and venture capitalist said, software is eating the world. It's replacing everything that we used to do manually and by paper. In fact, if you look at the developments over the last 25 years, we can see all of the systems that we use have been developed in that time, and a lot of them even in the past 15 years as well. So now we can go to space with Blue Origin and SpaceX. We can drive electric cars provided by Tesla and Xpeng. We can, we can book places that are no longer hotels. They're Airbnbs. We can order food. We can play games online. We can consume information in new ways through augmented reality. It's exciting times. But with that, we have to consider the data that comes from underneath and provides the foundation. So we, we're good at generating data, transferring that into information and providing knowledge into our organizations. And ultimately, there's a huge amount of value in our organizations from a wisdom perspective. Today, all of this is processed and driven forward by human intervention, but technology is coming to change this vastly. In fact, 88% of businesses worldwide plan to adopt robotic automation into their infrastructure, putting intelligence in the systems that they use. And that artificial intelligence is going to redefine how the world works. And some people are saying that artificial intelligence is going to be as essential and as embedded as electricity going forward. In fact, advances in AI will transform modern life by reshaping transportation, health, science, finance, and the military. And absolutely every part of society will be touched by artificial intelligence. Everyone watching this online has been touched by artificial intelligence today in the email and the social networks and the systems that you use online. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. In fact, that ubiquity and that power is going to have a huge effect on the global economy. And they think that by 2030, there's going to be a $15.7 trillion bump due to increased productivity and consumption side effects. So it's going to make the way that we operate much more effective and we're going to be able to augment who we are with this intelligence. So now we can remove some of that drudge work of data and information uh, divination and we can start to focus our organizations on knowledge and wisdom and really connecting with people. And AI is going to be driving evaluation and research and observation and feedback. And that should make for a better world for our organizations and the people that we serve. But what about jobs for the people in the places we live and work in? Is that suddenly going to be changed? Well, we cannot replace everyone with machines. Uh, that's a fallacy. Um, we, talk, we hear people talking about millions of jobs lost to robots and artificial intelligence. Well, I think it's just a shift of tasks. Again, the drudge work is going to be done at the data and information level and the strategy and wisdom of all of our employees is going to be really coming from the empathy, humor, creativity and problem solving that we have developed over the years. And those things are really hard to codify and automate. So we're looking at a world of what I call intelligence augmentation. So it's going to be about human and the machine, and it's going to be about us operating together in a way that provides better service to everyone and better support to all those people in our organization. So now we're in a world of algorithmic living and it's defining who we are and how we operate in society, and it's completely revolutionizing the insurance industry. In fact, now we've got three different interplays between data and artificial intelligence, between ethics and the, the considerations behind uh, bias and inclusion and empowerment, and we're also thinking about how that power is distributed as well. When I think of algorithmic living and insurance, there's one company that springs to mind. About six years ago out of New York, 
a company called Lemonade came up with home insurance and an application that allowed people to, to buy policies and administer themselves uh, through a very simple user interface. This user interface has changed over the years and now you can literally speak to your camera and they work out if they can trust what you're saying is right and decide whether to go into further triage or they can actually pay your claim straight away. In fact, they're saying some of the fastest claims they've ever done has only taken about three to four seconds in terms of processing. It's a game changer. But with this kind of service and this kind of tech stack, we're starting to see some real challenges around AI and bias and what that actually means for everyone out there that needs insurance. And there's been a huge amount of uh, discussion around whether that's fair and ethical or whether that really is the way that insurance should work as well. And they've been vilified and they've been made fun of. But ultimately, I feel that this kind of thing is really pushing insurance into the future, into a way where we, if we can create inclusion, diversity, equity, and we can provide great service, then we're in a good place. It's interesting. They use 100 times more data than, than the average insurers, or so they say. It's about 1,600 data points. Uh, and it's interesting. They create nuanced profiles. And this is where the divisions between sort of privacy and empowerment are really uh, challenged. And we have to have deep discussions across the entire insurance industry whether this can work for companies as a whole. In fact, we have to look even outside of the insurance industry and start to look at what's, what the dialogue is in the world around algorithmic bias and ethics as well. This great movie, do go and watch this, it's called Coded Bias, and it talks about um, people that are discriminated against uh, through algorithms, the non-recognition of people because of their race and age and, and the such like is something that Melissa will talk about, but it's something that this movie investigates as well. And we're headed into a world where there's going to be even more data than before. Over 4,900 digital data engagements per person each day by 2025. That's approximately one digital interaction every 18 seconds. And this is us interacting with our systems and our friends and our emails and our applications. But all of the systems behind us that are, that are interacting with our second and third selves out there in cyberspace. And the office is starting to take on this substrate of understanding of, of there's cameras and sensors and monitors and corporate surveillance of employees. And CB Insights has, has shown us this world. It's hugely interesting to start thinking about you know low touch, voice enabled technology, remote collaboration tools, spatial intelligence. But all of this comes at a cost of it captures everything that you do and ultimately you can be monitored. And companies like Teleperformance are working with service centers all over the world to, to provide this kind of intelligence. Now, when does uh, a collaboration and, and monitoring turn into surveillance and something that's, that's far more uncomfortable for people uh, within the companies themselves? The contract allows constant monitoring of what we're doing but also our family. I think it's really bad. We don't work in an office. I work in my bedroom. I don't want to have a camera in my bedroom. And that's a, a Colombian-based worker that, that works for that company uh, and, and services Apple customers as well. And that's really worrying when we start to see that amount of invasion of privacy. Companies see a lot of benefit in putting software to do all the kinds of monitoring they would have otherwise expected their human managers to do. But the reality is that it's much more intrusive than surveillance conducted by a boss. And that's from Vina Dubao from the University of California. And, and where we start to look at the, the benefits of oversight versus um, the, the encroachment of our personal space and our rights, you know, that's a question of inclusion and diversity and recognition and saying to people, we trust you to do your job. We've employed you because of that, that level of trust that we've, we've gained from you during the process there as a service provider in your teams or whether you're a direct employee. And as we start to move from the idea of uh, using data and algorithms for our benefit, we have to consider the increased exposure in our lives. Now, I've spoken about 
infinite humanity, but really we've now got biological knowledge, computing power and data coming together to be a, a potent and powerful force that can really be good in the world and it can also be very concerning due to the exponential exposure that comes from that. And once we've got that exposure through network and psychological effects, it can deeply affect humanity. But what's even more worrying from a, a personal perspective is that we could be targeted. Uh, a great friend of mine, Patrick Neal, who's a, a professor of cybersecurity, talks about the war on one. So everyone's at risk and ultimately everyone has been captured by the algorithms in the platforms that we use. And I'd like to pass over to Melissa to take us through some thoughts about allyship in a world with algorithms. Thanks, Nick. Today I'm going to be talking about active allyship as it intersects with our algorithmic world. Granted that social media has come to play a huge part of our lives and a huge part of changing culture, I want to take some time to talk about the way users are using different platforms, the way the platforms are playing a part in these cultural shifts, and discuss some things that we might need to spend a little bit more time thinking about. My name is Melissa Salkbeke. I'm a speaker, digital ethnographer, and creative strategist, but most importantly, I'm a lifelong lover of the World Wide Web. I've made a career out of being extremely online, helping brands and organizations understand how people use the internet to plan for the future. Part of my love for this type of work has come from the way that I've witnessed myself and the people in my life use the internet. We tell our stories online, we share our interests, and leave digital traces that essentially become artifacts. It's why I love putting my friends' tweets in decks. And I'm not the only one who spends this much time online. Now, for years, we spent a lot of time online, but COVID-19 has increased our time on social media and other parts of the internet. Last year, Americans spent on average more than 1,300 hours on social media. It made me wonder, how much of your time is actually screen time? When we look into the data, it depends on the platform. On Facebook, it can be 58 minutes. On Instagram, 53. It really depends on who you are, your age group, and your preferred space. But when we start thinking about that time yearly, that's when the numbers really start to add up. And so to answer the question of how much time is your screen time, for most Americans, it's 3.5 hours a day. So what does this have to do with insurance? Well, in a time in history where we haven't really been able to be ourselves in a physical world, we've had to be ourselves online. And we find people saying statements like, I post therefore I am. This isn't happening in isolation. This is a feeling that's shared by generations of people, people from all ages, all walks of life. It makes me think about the internet and the role it plays in our lives. I think the internet is a tool. It's a tool that has many different use cases. It's a tool that helps us learn a tool that allows us to share information, a tool that we can use to entertain ourselves. And most importantly, in a year where we've lived a global pandemic, it's a tool that allows us to connect. These tools are empowering. Now, who have these tools empowered? On a platform like TikTok, we've seen different marginalized groups and minority communities use the platform to increase their representation, share their voice, and tell their story. Some accounts I highly recommend following are Notorious Cree, a creator from the indigenous community, Crutches and Spice, a creator who focuses on activism and disability, and Jesse Sully, a trans parent navigating transitioning while also being a parent. We are at a festival celebrating diversity and inclusion, but I want to encourage us to think differently about what those terms mean. One of the incredible use cases of TikTok has been witnessing the ways that members of our community who are older have used the platform to simply be a part of culture. It's great to see the diversity of creators on this platform, but it's also important to think about the audiences and who exactly is watching all this content. And essentially what this means is that the internet and social media provide minority groups and marginalized communities with the opportunity to connect with others, share their experiences, find role models, and create content reflecting their own life that isn't represented elsewhere to audiences in sizes previously unimagined. The thing is, while these tools empower us, we're also at the mercy of these platforms. In 2019, TikTok admitted that it had suppressed videos by disabled, queer, and fat creators as its algorithm believed that these pieces of content were vulnerable to cyberbullying. 
Examples of other creators and users that would have been susceptible to bullying and harassment included people with facial disfigurement, autism, Down syndrome, and disabled people or people with some facial problems. The other observation that I have with the ways in which we're telling our stories online is how much we're becoming a watchdog society and how much we have completely forgotten that we don't know who is and who isn't watching or how the information that we're putting out into the world is being used. On the same platform, TikTok, there's a creator named Savannah Sparks, and Savannah is a lactation consultant and doctor of pharmacy who's come to be known as a prolific watchdog on the platform, calling out people and creators who are trying to spread misinformation and COVID-19 related conspiracy theories. Now, that's one aspect of the ways in which we don't know who's watching our content, we don't know how it's being used, and we don't know how what we post online will influence the life that we live offline. But we're also seeing it happen in the world of insurance. In 2018, a man from Montreal made public headlines when he revealed that his insurance claims had been denied after his insurance provider used his social media activity to investigate whether or not he was actually living with depression. In the article, he says, they could see I was very active, posting, I have children, I looked happy, I was running, that kind of stuff. Every doctor nowadays agrees that exercise is probably the best natural anti-depression there is out there. And so the way that he was telling his story online was being misinterpreted from some of the things he was actually dealing with in the real world. And all of this is starting to become an industry norm. In 2019, New York State allowed New York insurers to evaluate social media to set premiums and dispute claims if they could prove why this source of information was valid for, for the specific case. And when we think about the future of these kinds of activities and behaviors, it's really interesting to think about our online presence. Experts worry that if this social media surveillance world does come to pass, opaque algorithms and decontextualized data could lead to unfair higher premiums or ding people who don't know how to effectively signal health. Up until now, we've been discussing the public use of our social media accounts, the ways in which we consent to have our own information published, but we should also think about the ways that these activities happen privately. In August of 2021, it was revealed that Google had shared geofence warrants with members of the law enforcement. In a public statement, they said, we vigorously protect the privacy of our users while supporting the important work of law enforcement. But these users did not consent to having their physical information and digital histories shared with members of the police. And all these examples lead me to wonder, who has the power to intervene? Who has the power to identify bias? Who holds who accountable? It's actually those same users that are using those platforms. In 2020, a user identified that Twitter's algorithm was rich with bias. When posting a photo of Barack Obama and Mitch McConnell, the algorithm prioritized the photo of Mitch McConnell. And this led people to play around and test the algorithm, challenging it to identify the many biases that existed. What was revealed? that Twitter's photo cropping algorithm prefers young, beautiful, and light-skinned faces. So how does Twitter deal with this? Well, again, they take it to the users. In 2021, at a conference, Twitter released its first algorithm bias bounty challenge, assigning a cash prize to different submissions that revealed the way in which its algorithm is rich with bias. A statement from Twitter said, we want to take this work a step further by inviting and incentivizing the community to help identify potential harms of this algorithm beyond what we can identify ourselves. Because sometimes we don't know our own biases. Results from this contest revealed biases towards age, race, skin color, but what stood out to me is a bias that I didn't even consider, a bias towards language. And this isn't just happening on Twitter, it's happening on platforms like TikTok too. And bringing this back to allyship, this puts us in a very weird position. Here we have a user by the name of Ziggy Tyler, and one putting a bio on TikTok's creator marketplace so that he could generate revenue from the content that he created, he was unable to include Black Lives Matter as a, a subject in which his content spoke to. But when he changed the language to white supremacy or anti-Semitism or pro-white, the platform didn't suppress it. It allowed him to post. The internet has always been a tool, but now it's an even bigger tool, and it's the mainframe for holding people accountable. So yes, the internet is a tool, but it's also a weapon. And when we talk about active allyship in an algorithmic world and discuss things like intention to action, 
we also need to think about accountability, privacy, and bias. I hope what you've realized today from this talk is that the internet gives us a great power, but with that great power comes a great responsibility. And sometimes that power can be misused or abused. When we think about active allyship in an algorithmic world, we need to be cognizant of the fact that the biases that exist in society exist in these platforms, and they're embedded in ways that are complicated to understand. When insurance providers are using this information to dispute claims or come up with premiums, I want to encourage you to think differently about what those posts mean, how they made their way online, and all the ways that they can be interpreted differently from what the user intended. And as always, just because someone posts it online doesn't mean they consent to having you see it. Thank you so much for your insights, Melissa. That was really fascinating to be taken down into the idea around identity, inclusion, accountability in today's fast moving world. And I'm gonna take us into the final part of this keynote by talking about strategic foresight. And this is what myself and my think tank do for all of the clients that we work with to help them look out 5, 10, 20 plus years into the future. And once we start to look that far out, uh, we can create future narratives that build on a bigger vision, strengthen strategic planning and anticipate risks today. And we use an umbrella framework called the Foresight Development Framework. And we look at some principles and we ground ourselves in that. And it lends itself nicely to the conference. Humanity, not technology. It's about us. It's not about the systems. Plurality, inclusion and equity. These, these are things that are grounded in what we think about as part of the insurance industry and technology industry and the wider world and scientific fact and creativity because the creativity and using progression in science, uh, technological science, social science and the such like is so important for society. And very much like we've taken you through in this keynote, we look at the signals of change that matter to our clients and we build out hypothetical scenarios. What does the future look like in 5, 10, 20 plus years? That's when we get creative and we can go even further and we can write speculative fiction, science fiction stories, but we really start to consider things across a number of different dimensions financial, organizational, regulatory, cultural, environmental, political, technological, and social. And this in-depth process helps us understand the initiatives and what needs to happen in those 5, 10, 20 plus years. And then we can start to take those narratives and we can do something that we call backcasting, which is take information and ideas and evidence from that future and bring it back to today to build roadmaps towards a better future for all. And I've done this with many different clients as well. Earlier this year, I worked with a client to write science fiction stories and to look at the signals out there across everything from ocean economies to uh, what happens uh, in, in Saudi Arabia and beyond with transportation between cities when it gets too hot, to humanity and, and what's happening in Africa, to biology cities and what happens when we start to establish communities in space. And it's been found that companies that invest in foresight tend to uh, do better in the world. Firms that have high future preparedness can expect on average uh, a 33% higher profitability and a 200% higher market capitalization growth. And that's a, a study by Rohrbeck and Kung. And a couple of years ago, they really sort of uncovered some of that value by looking at dozens of organizations that have invested in foresight over the years. And that's it. We've taken you from what is to what if, and that invitation to be creative, to think bigger, to think about opportunities, and also to be responsible today, to recognize the vibrancy of humanity and how to think about inclusion and diversity in those realms. And that's it, facing our futures. It's an incredibly exciting time for us all. I'm gonna leave you with this quote. If we all start being the allies we want to be, to show up and for our colleagues to do the work. We can drive lasting and meaningful change. And again, that's from Daisy Orga Dominguez. And I can't think of better words to end the presentation. Thank you, and I look forward to the Q&A.